I would like to introduce my fellow panelists. Firstly, we have Greg. Greg's been a wildlife uh, rescuer and carer for 20 years, specialising in kangaroos and devoted much of the last 10 years to the protection of kangaroos. Is a staunch advocate against the commercial killing of kangaroos and has been involved in international campaigns to halt the um, export and the commercial slaughter of kangaroos. He is, as you can see, in kangaroo country right now. He's got a large conservation land hold in um, central west of New South Wales. Um, and we're so happy to have him as part of the Animal Justice Party. Greg has stood as a candidate for us three times and is the regional group leader of the Blue Mountains. Uh, we also have Dr Anne Marks with us, and Anne has been a licensed wildlife rescuer and carer specialising in macropods, that's kangaroos and wallabies, for five years, and she's currently advocating for the prevention of motor vehicle collisions with kangaroos in the Hawkesbury area, which is the Sydney's northwest. And we have Zoe Schmidt, who is an AJP member and a kangaroo lover, somebody who fell in love with her local group of kangaroos and became inc incredibly distressed as development rolled in and destroyed their home and saw them pushed onto the highway, getting killed every day. And so she started a local campaign in Penrith to help those kangaroos. So the reason that um, Anne and Zoe came along today was to just really show that individuals can make a difference and both of, and the work that they're doing is making a huge difference to kangaroos and it shows that we all have the power to do something to help and we know that kangaroos are losing their habitat at a massive rate and being pushed onto roads and pushed out of their home so we're going to start with Greg and we're going to run through a presentation and then um, about wildlife rescue 101 to skill you guys up and then move on to Anne and so and so we have um you guys can this is a webinar so you won't be able to see yourselves and you won't be able to speak but you can communicate with us through the chat and there's also a q and a function down the bottom there so if you pop your questions into the q and a we're going to have a, a we're going to leave enough time at the end to do questions and answers and we will also be sending out this presentation to everybody and also the slides that we're using as well um, so Greg, I'll, I'll just hand over to you if you want to like have some opening remarks and then I can let me know when you're ready to start the presentation and I'll share my screen. Sure. Thanks, Louise. Can you hear me okay? Uh, yeah, what an important thing to do and thanks for organising this uh, as you do it annually. Uh, you know, we're all about to embark on Australia's 800 and nearly 900,000 kilometres of roads and um, annually, it's been estimated now that 10 million animals a year die uh, on our on Australia's roads every year. So a little bit we can do along the way is very important. You know, it's not all about, um, you know, species conservation and such. Uh, you know, it's a lot of work that we do collectively to do that sort of stuff. But um, <clears throat> it also comes down to the individual. You know, the uh, blue tongue lizard is on his back that can't ride himself uh, in 40 degree heat or the turtle with a cracked shell that needs some help. Uh, the kangaroo, Joey in a pouch. So we can all uh, alleviate that pain and fear that those animals have. And, um, you know, everybody wants to help, but it's uh, sometimes it's hard. You've got to dig deep to stop, you know, to make the decision to stop and uh, render assistance to an animal. But it's uh, so important to fear. Your fear is nothing like the fear that the animal has that's, that is on the side of the road, watching cars go by and um, nobody stopping. So hopefully tonight, so uh, just some basic ideas. It certainly doesn't replace wildlife training, of course, and the work of uh, trained wildlife volunteers. But what it does is just put some uh, ideas and things that you can uh, draw on when you are uh, embarking on holidays this year and travelling on the roads. So uh, it's really important, I think, uh, for reducing the risk um, of you know having an accident with an animal by planning your trip and it's a good uh, it's a good topic to have a discussion with around the table with people because we need to travel in Australia we need to travel in the daylight hours there's no doubt about it so many of our mus you know, mammals and uh, all of the native animals uh, so many are nocturnal um, or are out at dawn and dusk and we don't want to be traveling at those times so if you can possibly plan your trip so that you get to your destination before dark 
and advise other people to do it's a really good message because it's that last 15 minutes or that last hour when you're getting to your destination you've left the city the big smoke and you're heading north or south or west and uh, that's where the accidents happen and that's shown in insurance data as well that the majority of accidents that happen that involve wildlife are at those particular times particularly dusk so um, it's good to get to your destination beforehand and it's good to plan your trip so that happens. Uh, you, discussions, yes, go ahead. I was just going to say, Greg, do you want me to start the slideshow? Because it, it covers yeah. that, yeah. Good, put it in the background. And you'll be able yeah. to see it, yeah. I'm going to share my screen. So that's the first one. Can you see that, Greg? Yes, that's good. Thank you. <clears throat> so wherever possible, don't, don't travel at dawn and dusk and, and advise other people to do so. Allocate more time and slow down. And well, it's always good if you can allocate a little bit extra time. There's not an argument when you decide if you're the driver or the passenger and you want to pull over to check an animal, uh, you know, it reduces the arguments in the car. You're not on such a, a tight um, time frame. You don't need to be there at a particular time. So allow a little bit of time and actually, you know, discuss that. We've got a little bit of time there if we need to render assistance. Drive to conditions is so important. Um, well, speed's always the factor and uh, new data shows that um, if you can reduce your speed, you know, from 80 down to 90, you reduce your uh, incident of hitting an animal by 30% because you have that little bit more time to react. And so does the animal as well. Driving to conditions, of course, you know, you can, um, when you're looking at the road ahead and you're traveling, if it's raining, you can expect different animals. So it's always good to assess where you are. It's not rocket science, it's really just driving along and, and putting your mind to uh, where you're traveling. You know, pine forests on either side, you could, could expect uh, very abrupt animals, that can, you know, abruptly have animals in, right in front of you. Um, it's raining, so you're looking for turtles. It's a hot day. So, um, uh, blue tongue lizards, particularly, you know, from December, January, as animals travel um, and are, you know, doing their business, our roads fracture their whole, um, you know, their whole landscape. So have a think about what you're likely to come across in front of you as well. And have your rescue kit ready if the inevitable happens to come across something and you want to, um, you want to stop. It's always such a relief to have just a few basic items. You don't have to carry the full ambulance. But uh, just some very basic items, which we'll go through later, just to be able to reach for and to be able to help help the animals. I was just going to um, chime in. In New South Wales, there's an app um, where you can type in your location and they will give you the, the closest rescue. Um, when we send out the uh, recording and the slides, we'll also include um, numbers of uh, who you can call in each state and whether there's relevant apps for you to download in each state. And I've used that i4 app and it's so amazing to just be able to um, type in where you are and they'll give you the rescue. So we'll send that out to everybody. I think this is one of the biggest ones that people, uh, biggest issues that people have and I have and probably everybody has is like how how do you see an animal like everybody's going a hundred kilometers or 110 you know how do you how do you stop and be safe I guess oh you're on mute Greg I'm sorry I'm conscious of the wind up here yeah staying oh. calm staying calm so important but that's the beauty about not being in that uh, flurry of 100 kilometres an hour, you know, a convoy of vehicles. If you can uh, travel at a little bit reduced speed, it gives you more reaction time. You can see what's coming rather than have to pass an animal and then turn around. I think that it's good to expect that anything on the road is possibly uh, an animal or a bird or a reptile of some type. Um, Either that or the, uh, you know, the McDonald's, bag, the McDonald's bag, which a lot of us rescue all the time, or the Kentucky Fried Chicken bucket, unfortunately. But, yes, to be able to have that extra reactive time is so important that you can pull over prior to the animal and always be conscious of where your hazard lights are. So you can hit the hazard lights, pull over. And I think there's a greater acceptance now of people slowing down. I used to be embarrassed in the old days pulling up and, you know, people would beat their horns and, and such. But I think there's a greater expectation now for people to help animals, particularly after we lost billions of them in the fires. So, um, yeah, 
keeping slow, keeping aware of what's coming up, assume that something on the road is a live animal and uh, have the time to be able to pull over safely, hitting your hazard lights straight away, of course, and all of those uh, precautions that you would have to take with the vehicles travelling at high speeds around you. If, if it's uh, not worth uh, creating a greater incident by taking uh, a, an unacceptable risks. So sometimes you won't be able to help, um, but yeah, uh, making an assessment and uh, doing doing so safely. Don't be afraid to call the police or the road authority if you can't help, or even if there is something on the road and uh, you're not confident. Um, often the police will come out and render assistance and, and um, of course, wildlife cares. Wildlife rescue organisations are the first port of call, but if you're in some place and your I4 app can't identify somebody nearby, um, the police are always plan B. Um, sitting back and assessing the situation, it's a good thing always to have some really cheap you know, binoculars in the car or you use your camera or your phone so that you can have a look and see if there is a, um, a kangaroo on the road, whether or not um, you would expect the joey to be in the pouch. You might be able to see that that's the case or if uh, animals you know, trying to move. Um, so that's another good way to assess the situation before you just jump out. There have been lots of uh, injuries and a number of fatalities of people that have run into traffic to uh, save an animal and uh, at their own demise. So keeping yourself and others safe is, is, uh, is a priority. Uh, yeah, it's a hard one to do not swerve. I often uh, worry about that um, and being able to hold the line, um, you know, but that's a, the other beauty about going a little bit slower and uh, have more reactive time is that you can, um, you can really uh, do so in a much more controlled manner. Um, yeah, steering around the animal in a controlled manner. If you can't avoid the animal safely, you might have to hit it to avoid injury or death to yourself and others. So that's a really hard one for most of us who care so much. Um, but there will be uh, occasions if you're traveling. Once again, speed's a killer. If the animal has been killed, remove it from the road if it's safe to do so. <clears throat> of course, house checking is one of the major things to do so if you can remove the animal safely. The other uh, advantage of that that you would all know is that um, it's less likely that another animal will be killed, will be killed as a result of trying to feed on that animal. So uh, that's a good thing to do. Uh, if a native, native animal has been hurt, you should contact wildlife. So wires, uh, Sydney Wildlife in New South Wales, uh, Wildlife Victoria. So, but the I4 app is a, uh, is a tool that's getting better and better all the time, which gives more options. And if you are in a remote area, it will have a, uh, somebody that's in, in that area that uh, will be able to assist and eventually have all vets that would be able, you would be able to take the animal to if you can, uh, if you're able to contain it and, and transport it to the vet. Uh, a bit of a disclaimer, what is the situation? Every situation is different and unique. So it's really hard just being involved in training of wildlife carers uh, for decades. You can't predict every uh, situation or scenario. So um, it's, it's hard to, to be skilled up. It really is, I still, uh, my heart, you know, beats in my chest, uh, pulling up at most rescues, even after thousands of them, because uh, you fear for the animal, you, you fear that you do the right thing, you don't make a mistake. Um, yeah, so it's, it's, a, it's a tough game, but um, it's certainly, uh, once you do it once, you become more confident and, uh, and you know, consider doing a wildlife training course so that you do have further skills that you can use. Um, we will do our best help oh, that assist the information. We yeah, we'll yeah. do our best to provide. So that'll be uh, you're including a lot of stuff with this uh, recording, aren't you, Louise? Yeah. That people can refer to. And we'll send a little handbook as well. And probably I'll send some links to some courses because I know Sydney Wildlife is having a course in February. So there's probably a lot of courses and, and most of and they're very um they are very cheap. They're like subsidized and they're not, they're mostly online with like one day kind of workshop is what the Sydney wildlife one is. So if people are able to do some more training, I think that gives you more, more confidence to help. Yes, Let's certainly. Skip to the next one. Yes, please. So, yes. Yeah, so it's a hot day. Um, 
there's a high incident of bird strike on hot, hot days because birds are very uh, susceptible to the heat, so they lose that energy. Usually they're up in the trees and just uh, not moving around, but if they are down and they're feeding, yeah, they do, uh, their, their reaction time is much slower. And you see it so often on the roads around here that uh, the birds are slower on a hot day. Um, and they don't get a bit of a break from the travelling motorists. And there is a high mortality of birds up here. Um, a lot of the times, also, if you're travelling, you might come across a younger bird that's on the ground. So I think it's important with birds and, and all animals, when you, if you do pull up, uh, there's a young bird there. If you look around and have a look for the parents, and uh, you can reunite, reunite them. They've just come out of the trees that line those rural roads, so that um, you know, putting them back up, might take a little bit of time just to make sure that the parents acknowledge, but uh, that's a good thing to do. You can't always take things away from their environments. If they're not injured, um, sometimes you have to also trust the animal, the bird, that it's uh, in its right environment. Uh, possums may come out of their tree hollows and drays. Yes, yeah, so that happens a lot on the urban interface and people experience that as householders. Uh, also, you can come across them on the road, but not so much. Kangaroos, yes, they become hot and you see them on the, on the, in paddocks and on the side of the road. They are licking their arms and they're trying to thermoregulate to cool themselves down and their chest and legs. So they look very distressed, but they are managing that heat. So um, it's not a situation where they need to come into care. Mostly these situations require you to do nothing other than fill up to fill up the bird bars and place. So we're talking pretty much around your home on this one and trying to assist wildlife by giving it water. A little bit different if you're out on the road. If you're worried about someone who hasn't moved, even after the cool breeze has blown, once again, reach out for a wildlife rescue volunteer for some advice. It's raining. Yeah, so first of November, the turtles started up here and they started crossing the road. So annually, they, they'll go from one dam to the next um, and dispersing males will be looking for their own territory. And it's not uncommon to see three or four in the daily 30 kilometre trip I do up here, uh, whether or not you get to them in time to save them. A lot of them uh, you do, but in high traffic areas, uh, yeah, the mortality rate is high. Animals are more likely to slip, and you see that with kangaroos on rainy days or at dusk when they're running, they do slip over. And uh, so it, once again, the speed is slow down in wet conditions. Keep an eye out what's in front of you. So. I find myself now, it's taken a while, but as you're driving, you, you, you're, not, uh, you're not relinquishing your concentration on the safety of driving, but you add that your brain seems to be scanning the road a little bit, you know, so you're always watching for uh, something to happen so that you are more aware. It seems to be something that doesn't take a long time when you're driving after an hour or so, you are really keeping an eye out on the verges and um, you know for things that might be coming out so it is it's something just to concentrate on i think and um and it's a, it's a good skill because it just seems to uh, uh you seem to be able to hone it and i'm lucky enough to predict a lot of those sort of things because i'm on the road so much uh, are you more likely to encounter a snake in the grass when it's hot and wet outside yes of course and even in the evening you know, our snakes come out at night they're nocturnal as well on hot days so uh, uh, it's always good to be cautious. Oh, I think I've got a video, Greg. I think it's you moving a, a lizard off the road. Do you want me to oh, play okay. That? Yeah, well, it just shows how easy it is. People are a little bit fearful of lizards, but if you pick a lizard up behind the front legs, they're gummy anyway, so it's not like they're going to take the end of your finger off, but just scooping him up before that car ran over him, um, and you can just see how I've got him behind the front legs. And, um, and did just took him across the road, the direction he was going and released him. So it is quite easy. I probably should have taken more care. So it's not a good example that car was approaching, but uh, I was pretty keen to get him. But um, yeah, and it's not it's like a, uh, there's not a great risk with a blue tongue lizard or a turtle, for example. So um, doing those guys are quite easy. There he goes. Off he goes, yeah. Oh, sorry. Oh, wait a sec. I think this is one a bit more about chicks, which you did talk about before. Right? Yeah, they usually get blown out on the side of the roads. And uh, I thought also travelling at night, tawny frogmouths and things, uh, those night birds that are out, boo book owls and such, 
they do get swept up behind trucks and uh, when they get uh, obviously hit by cars. I came across a boo book owl last week, just driving along a long stretch of dark road. He was on his back and I could have presumed he was dead. He was on the other side of the road. But uh, uh, I had to go around, turn around, come back. He was just couldn't ride himself. He had been concussed. So he was just uh, lying on the road. It was three or four in the morning. And um, he just couldn't get himself righted. So he would have died when the sun came up or another car would have come along. So <clears throat> that's the importance of presuming things aren't dead. Um, it's easy to go past and think, oh, no, you know, he's probably not... Uh, He's probably not alive, but how many times you've picked up even a rosella, you know, they're just concussed. They're laying there. If you can get them and um, get them out of the sun or get them out of the rain, the advantage of just having your basic kit. So if you've got a pillowcase, you invert the pillowcase, put your hand in that, walk up, and it's really safe and simple just to put the pillowcase over the top and invert the, the pillowcase and the animals or the bird is inside the pillowcase tie a knot in it, jump in the car, call for a wildlife uh, rescuer and uh, or go to the next township and, uh, and, and if there's a vet there. But that's where the I4 app will help you there. Help you there. The basic kit, yeah, um, anything, anything is a bonus. But um, a basic pet carrier, like a $15 pet carrier uh, from you know the $15 shop, uh, just a few things you throw in there and anything you've got there will be a, a bonus. The other thing is that if you've got those things and you haven't got a, a first aid kit, if you do come across uh, a human accident as well, you've got some things there that you might be able to uh, lend assistance. Um, if it is in an area where they have to wait for emergency services, but a couple of towels, certainly a couple of cotton pillowcases, they're your best friend, some sanitizer, warm fluffy blanket if you happen to have a small one you could throw in there tape is really good because on a lot of these times uh, tracy dodds gets us a lot of us uh, a biodegradable pink tape that we use on marking the animals on the side of the road and a lot of you probably use that or different things some people tear up um, old linen but if you can if you do check an animal and it's dead and you wrap something around part of the animal you know the kangaroo's forearm or uh, or whatever it is it's such a relief for the next person who cares that comes along. You've already gone into automatic mode wanting to stop the render assistance, but then you see a bit of tape or a bit of cloth and you just think, well, that was a respectful, you know, the animal's been, um, has been checked and what a respectful thing to do and you don't have to do it as well. So some tape or spray if you prefer, but then you've got a, a spray can in your car on a hot day. So I don't um, like that idea so, as much. Two torches, well, one torch is good. Um, obviously, it's, it's, not, um, it's better to be not travelling at night, but if you are and you do come across something you haven't got a torch, you're going to be really cranky with yourself. So a $10 torch in a bag, and it can be as simple as a shopping bag, just a Coles bag, with those items in there, um, just so in the boot, forgotten about until the day you need them. A hot water bottle is always handy uh, travelling at night in winter because you can stop at a service station, get a bit of hot water, and, you know, you have a, 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 a small wombat or something like that, or a bird, anything. You can provide some heat until you get to uh, get some assistance. Gloves, it's good to throw a couple of pairs in. Binoculars is nice to have if you uh, have some, put them in the car. Safety vest, well, wildlife carers are required to use those. Uh, you know, they're only a few dollars as well. So if you are doing a lot of travelling, it's good to have it there for a number of reasons. Duna covers are always very good <clears throat> because they're larger. You can put them over something that is a larger animal and, uh, and contain them. And, and often when you pull up, other people do pull up behind you as well. So you can get some assistance if you're, if you're dealing with something and you're not confident. Um, yeah, it's uncanny now how many people actually pull up to help you. So there's a greater, seems to be a greater level of care out there. Why cutters and scissors? Well, you never know. Um, you wouldn't be expected to cut a kangaroo out of a, a fence, but you could see a bird on a barbed wire fence. Um, you know, so it's handy to have a pair of wire cutters that are hanging around in the shed and some scissors as well. And the NRMA, I think, that sells wildlife the kits, I think, through like Byron Wildlife Rescue. So you can purchase them. We can put a link in and it's got some like basic things all together. I think they're about $50, Greg. Yeah, maybe a bit more, but they're excellent. Yeah, and, and they can double up for 
um, for humans as well. Yeah, they've got lots of items in there, so. You shouldn't really drive by a human uh, accident, I suppose. So, I um, won't the play up. the kit. This is what you putting the kit together, but I think it's quite a long video. So, but we'll include that um, in the mail out tomorrow. Yeah, that's got uh, a better explanation of all those items. Um, so. Oh yeah, sorry. Yeah. Yeah. Do you want to cover this one? Yeah, because uh, I think it's the biggest thing that stops people helping sometimes. Being yeah, it, well, it is scary, isn't it? Natural, yeah. Yeah, it's quite scary to pull up. It does take courage to help an animal. Uh, even those of us who have been doing it for years, so I've said before, uh, yeah, a lot of us still get very, and a lot of you guys would get very uh, you know, high-level anxiety when you're doing rescues because you never know what to expect and uh, you want to make sure you do it right and alleviate the the fear and the suffering. Uh, you want to try to get it right. Remember, you can only do your best, of course, and that's enough. Your empathy and concern and your intention to provide compassion and comfort is just as important as any action taken. It's certainly respect, respectful to the animal. Uh, be brave and remember that being injured and terrified is even scarier. Your fear is greater, so much greater than our fear of uh, pulling up and, and having a go, you know. So... Um, what a great thing to do. Scary. Things always look scary. Uh, and you see those sort of uh, defensive movements, poses and postures, uh, you know, like a tawny frog mouth screaming at you. Um, the lizard throwing his mouth open like he's really scary, but he's not. Um, the echidna and kangaroo chest puppers. So all those things are defensive, uh, you know, defensive motions to scare you away because you're a predator. Um, funny enough, I think over the years, and a lot of you would experience this, animals will be uh, so accepting of uh, assistance that, you know, that initial bravado that they have uh, soon um, soon goes away, particularly once you get them uh, contained. And the advantage, again, of just having those um, cotton pillowcases or a small duna cover. Scary sounds, that's always, uh, yeah, it puts you off a little bit. But... It, once again, just bravado, and they're scared and they're injured, so um, you just got to drive past that. And Greg, Very rarely. if you if you put uh, the pillowcase or a towel or, or something, is that comforting or takes Certainly, away yeah, some like, of the fear? Yeah, taking away takes away the fear very quickly, and then they get they probably have more time to to uh, deal with their pain. You know, they can put more focus on dealing with their pain rather than having the fear and having to be in defensive mode. Once you take away that visual uh, from them and have them in there, yeah, they settle, usually settle quite quite well. And those that are experienced enough that do that with, you know, kangaroos in certain situations, find them that they settle down um, because you're taking that, that fear away. Too scary. Yeah, well, there's probably lots of things that you shouldn't have a go at, um, but pulling up... Uh, Contacting a wildlife rescue uh, service like WISE in, in uh, New South Wales. A couple of important things to do there is to collect as much information when you make the call. If your phone can do a, you do a photo with the GPS coordinates, that's always handy for those of us that have to go out. If you can't stay, if it's going to be too long, uh, the animal's safe if you can move it off the road or if it's in a position where it will be safe until somebody comes and you need to keep going, once again, that bit of ribbon, or even uh, if you can tie something around the nearest tree or the nearest fence post and use that as a marker for the rescue that's rescue that's coming because often you'll be going up and down the highway looking for an injured kangaroo over a number of kilometres, um, you know, and you may miss it. So um, do as much as you can, collect as much information and observation as you can, make the call, um, and that's such an important thing to do. That's your contribution. Um, the safe ways to pick up animals that are pointy and heavy. So just a couple of things on there just quickly. Um, echidnas are tricksters because on hot days they're on the side of the road where the bitumen stops and there's gravel. A lot of you would know that they, they go along there because there's ants. So they're on the side of the road and you get a lot of calls from people that are concerned about them because they're so close to the road, but they're just shopping. So often you can't do anything for that guy, obviously, he's just spending hours there picking up ants along the way. So you can't say, 
something a bit so scary. Uh, yeah, you can't always pick up everything and get it into a safe position. Sometimes you have to trust them. They pick up the vibration of the vehicles, so they seem to know how far to stay off the road. So um, there are, if you're stuck picking up, for example, if you're stuck picking up an echidna, that's where a towel is very handy and throwing it over the top. If you do get your fingers in either side and tickle their belly, they will fold over. But um, the towel is the way to do it, those guys. Wild Animals Instinct was the last oh. sentence there. Sorry, Greg. Sorry, Louise. I'm a sorry, I'm sorry. Drag, dragging the train there. No, they see you as a predator and don't take it personally. Yeah. Moving, tagging and spraying. So we've probably pretty much covered that, but the... Yeah. The, such a great advantage of having um, it's so such a relief to see animals that have already been tagged and checked. Transporting, obviously, if you do happen to have an animal in the car, you've got to keep pretty quiet and get your destination as quick as you can. Um, it's really essential to pass them on to people that have the skills and uh, and the knowledge. <clears throat> you may have to hold overnight at times, but. Yeah, you can't be tempted to uh, to raise them. We have so many joeys that come in for different animals, different mammals, particularly kangaroos, of course. As you know, that people keep for weeks, and and um, by the time they come into wildlife carers' hands, they're um, yeah, sometimes the wheels are in motion for their demise. You know, they've gone too far. They've been drinking cow's milk, and uh, a lot of stress eating popcorn, watching reruns of Mash. So, um, quickly as possible to wildlife carers. Pouch check. Yeah, that's scary. Sometimes you feel uh, it took me a long time to be comfortable with pouch checks. Um, there's a little video. You're going to attach that one. Yeah, I think the video is on the. Yeah, here's the video. Oh, actually, I've got a. Sorry. Wasn't linked there, this one. Why is that not? It's loading. Sorry. There it is. Sorry, everyone. Oh, there we go. That's, I don't think, oh, wait a sec, my sound's not working. Is that? I can talk you through that. Anyway, I just pulled up for this uh, lady kangaroo on a corner that, where they get hit a lot up here. Opening up the pouch is very elastic that a lot of you would know. You can open it up and look inside. Uh, it's quite clean inside the pouch. The mums keep the, the, you know, the environment. It's like the bedroom. So clean. So it's not that, uh, it's not that scary. You can see how uh, if, as long as the um, kangaroo hasn't been deceased for too long, uh, you can get that pouch quite wide open. So that's the advantage of having a torch because you can look inside to see if there's any little joey in there and you can also see if you're a carer often we'll look for different sized teats or, or engorged glands that would show that there was a young kangaroo with this mum because often you get called for kangaroos like this lady whose young joey would be coming back uh, waiting for mum to wake up sort of thing you know would be coming back at night uh, or just off the road somewhere in the bush. We spent a couple of hours looking there and we set up a couple of joey bags on stands nearby to her once we took her off the immediate roadway. Uh, but we weren't lucky enough to catch the joey. But she's definitely had a, uh, a joey at foot, which is just tragic that um, the little guy was out there. So, Greg, if you found that and you thought that well, there was a joey about, you you would ring the, uh, like wild like wires or whatever. Yeah, and, 100%. Um, yeah. Yeah, it's like seeing, I think so, yeah. It's like seeing a wombat that's affected by mange. You know, you think, oh, the poor bugger, uh, you know, as you drive by. But by taking those coordinates or just a general, you know, location, that wombat would be there every day. Um, yeah, and passing it on, there are um, organisations that will treat uh, wombat mange and uh, what a wonderful thing that is to do. So, um, but the same would happen with joeys there, yes. Spent many hours trying to, um, catch joeys that have been with mums when they've been hit. Yeah, oh, okay. it is a it's a tough thing to do, but it's a it's a good thing to do. I, I explained in that video. There's um, well, we've got a 
kangaroo here at the moment, the little Joey, 19 hours in the pouch uh, in th- it was probably 2 p.m. by the time we got it, uh, hit 9, 9 p.m. the night before, so 19 hours in the pouch. But he was still okay, and he was in the sun, 34 degrees. Uh, but mum had closed the pouch up and um, before she died, and he was in there and... <laughs> Uh, somehow, you know, the, regulated the temperature enough to, for him not to be, uh, you know, completely <clears throat> uh, dehydrated or dead. So we were able to get him out, and he's quite fine uh, now. So it shows you the resilience resilience of them and how good those pouches are at maintaining, you know, uh, the safety of the joey, even you know, post mortem. And and if there was a joey in there, that would the person stopping you you wouldn't try and get the joey out you'd call wires or would people pick up the whole kangaroo and and transport that kangaroo with the joey still in the pouch yeah well it depends on where you are if you're in a remote area and uh, it would take hours for somebody or there wasn't a carer because there are areas where there is just no wildlife carer um you can when you open the pouch if the joey's not on the teeth um you know, it's quite, it's easier with your pillowcase to offer the joey the pillowcase and put your hand in and scoop the joey out into the pillowcase. If it's on the teat, if the, if the little one is still suckling the teat, uh, that's a little bit more complicated and, and, a, and a different level of um, risk, you know, by cutting the teat. So it would be good if it's a small kangaroo and you feel comfortable enough and you know where you're going to the next town and you needed assistance, you could. I've often... Where I've, uh, when I first started doing rescue, I used to uh, put the bodies of kangaroos and possums and things where I wasn't confident getting a joey out. I would take them to, uh, you know, a local carer, and uh, who was much more experienced than me. So um, there's a couple options there, but quite often they're not on the teeth, so you can get them out uh, without harming them um, and get them straight into uh, a safe environment. Um, unfurred animals, unfurred and feathered birds always in this if you're looking at a naked being definitely something wrong well certainly the high dependency so that's where you need the wildlife uh, rescue network these ones need warmth to exist yeah i'll just pick up a couple of points on there oh you want me to go back to that one sorry Bruce. yeah tuck it on your shirt yeah pop next to your body if you've got a, a joey in a pillowcase and you need to travel an hour to get the lithgow you're gonna uh, putting it up your shirt um, to get some body heat if you've got no other way of, of keeping uh, thermoregulating. So, you know, that can be done. Uh, and wrap the mum with the joey in the car. But that's certainly an option if you're comfortable with it and you want to do that. Naked, uh... Yeah, I've never found that to be true. And I don't know uh, what other people out there have been doing it for a long time think but uh the human touch uh yeah not unless you've got diesel uh, you know diesel oil on your fingers and such if you uh, just um you know follow you know basic hygiene there's never a problem with that carrier box yeah so that's the way to do it thank you yeah pass check yeah wombats are a trickier thing because uh, joey's facing backwards gets me every time um, and i'm not good at wombats uh, that's where uh, if you if it's a small female wombat and you are having trouble, you could put her in a doona cover and, and travel with her if their wildlife carer is not available too far away. The mange, that's important and wonderful programs. Up here we've got canimbla wombats and those girls are out all the time uh, dosing uh, wombats against mange and have great success. But it's a never-ending story. There's so many victims of mange. Well, I... Do you want to do the barbed wire, Greg? Um, animals in wire, what to do? Now, it's a really tough one. It's really scary. Checking to see what the situation is before you approach, of course. If you're not confident, I wouldn't do it. Um, it, it, it you know, it, it's, uh, it's a conundrum when you turn up on some of these uh, rescues, as a lot of people would know. Approaching carefully. Um, yeah, calling for help. If the animal's dead, check the pouch. There's a couple of ways of thinking with uh, kangaroos caught in fences, and you can come across them just travelling rural roads. It's quite uh, common. Uh, there's a number of impacts that put uh, kangaroos into fences. You know, unfortunately, Australia has a love affair and obsession with barbed wire. I know Animal Justice Party is working on 
trying to um, you know change uh, the way that we use barbed wire. We certainly don't need it, um, and it causes millions of deaths a year. Uh, cutting the fence wire is always dangerous, so don't rush in and just if you did have some cutters and think that cutting uh, the strands where the animals contained is the way to go because a lot of those fences are high tensile, so it's quite dangerous when you cut. Diane and I invert the kangaroos. It's a little bit harder when they're heavy, so you need two people. But if you invert them, usually their legs, they're caught by the toes, the feet, uh, around the ankles or the hock. Uh, if you invert them, which is a hard job, but it does it, um, it's a, uh, a safer way to do it if you've got assistance. That figure eight that they're caught in will go boing and you're able to take the animal out. Of course, it's going to need some help straight away. It really is something for an experienced carer. So you'd get straight on the phone. Yeah, you can see how that, she's a big uh, female kangaroo and she had been in there all day and she was holding her joey in the pouch, even though it was against uh, gravity. Um, Joey's still in the pouch there. Diane's just holding her body weight um, so I could get over the fence. But she's caught there. We lifted her up and that's a figure eight uh, released her feet and we were able to take her out without cutting the fence. Also, we had three buff heads watching us who just said, don't cut the fence, who wanted the shooter anyway. So, um, you know, it was a bit of a challenging situation. But, um, yeah, we got her out uh, without having to cut the fence. So that's the importance of having, a, uh, you know, an ever-increasing network of wildlife carers across Australia. Yeah, birds are relatively easy. Um, but the towel is always comes in handy. So um, if you're on the side of the road and there's an injured bird and uh, picked up a gang gang today, so what a threatened species now, gang gangs, a young fellow and uh, he'd been hit by a car. He's got a broken wing. So he's at the bed at the moment being assessed, but that doesn't look good for him. But um, yeah, I threw the towel from a couple of metres, just happened to land over the top of him, scooped him up straight in the carrier and uh, I was on my way and he was safe. So advantage again of having a little bit of gear in your car just for that uh, occasion. Bird strike up here on rural roads is just uh, is uh, so predominant and uh, funny thing a quick story on during COVID all the rural roads around up here and I expect right across the state weren't being mowed by council they were way behind but in the 30 odd kilometres I travel every day to pick up uh, native uh, animal food and pickings and, and, and brush all of the, over a period of five months, all of the magpies were killed because they couldn't eat or feed. They couldn't go to ground because the grass was so long that they were on the road uh, facing into the sides of the roads to be able to pick, to get food. And uh, as a consequence of that, uh, there were 32 uh, magpies killed over that period of time. And to this day, they still haven't come back along that section of road. So. It shows you how, you know, the impact of um, things we do and don't do uh, has on some species. Um, yeah, it doesn't look right. It's always good to report. Uh, up here, we prompt a lot of people to report um, kangaroos laying in paddocks because of uh, illegal shooting. So it's not a natural occurrence, uh, but certainly national parks need to know when that's happening. Uh, poisoning, lots of dead birds, possums impacted by rat poisons. Yes, coming into winter or at any time because of the prolific use of poisons. Kangaroos are slaughter shot. So what to do, record the evidence. So it is good to take as much detail as you can of anything like that. Compliance is very, uh, is very non-existence in, in government, in the, in the national parks, but uh, we've got to keep reporting them, those sort of situations. So. Uh, yeah, there's lots Sorry, of... Sorry, I'm uh, on mute. I think we've covered a lot of this, so... Yeah, a lot, think, a lot of it is quite basic. Yeah, and we can send this out because I'm just conscious of time and we've got some questions. So maybe I'll maybe I'll stop the screen share, look at the questions, mm -hmm. and then we'll um, go on to Anne and Zoe's after that. Um, yeah. Just have a look at the, the questions that we've got. Um, um, will it be recorded? Yes. Uh, here's one. I had a fledgling fall out of a nest, but no parents around and then tried to put it back and it fell out again. And 
slowly eventually passed away, what would you suggest in this case? Um, moved it into a, yeah, a, I guess, yeah, people try to put it back, but if it falls, I mean, it's a really hard call, isn't it? Do you try and put yeah. the bird back or do you put it, put the bird in a box and try and it? It is a hard one, yeah. Often, it, it, so often it does work, uh, but during the heat of the day, for example, it's a bit of a trick. You're trying to put a bird back. The parents are up in the tree. They don't uh, respond at all. It's too hot. They don't burn the energy during the day. So in those situations, you bring them in for a couple of hours. It's a little bit like a concussion. You pick up birds on the side of the road. They're just concussed. And other animals, they just, you've got to think of their, you know, their biology, their, you know, their functionality is so similar to us, the way they feel pain. They get a bump on the head. Um, or, you know, kangaroos are shot on the side of the road for looking lame, but they've actually just been hit. They've got an injury like a sports injury that we would have. Um, you, not everything's got to, you know, to die in those situations. So, um, yeah, the concussion is a big one, though. If you bring a bird in for a little while and take it back later in the afternoon, particularly on a hot day, have much more success in reuniting. But the skills that wildlife carers pick up over the years... Uh, more species specific and area specific. So once again, the importance of bringing um, bringing the wildlife rescue people. Um, I think we covered Sarah's about if you encounter a snake. I think we will leave the snake right, Greg, and call a wildlife rescue. Yeah, if they're on the road, there was a snake the day before yesterday. A beautiful black snake on the road, not far from here. All I did was get out and and stomped the ground and off he went. By the time I'd opened the door, he was gone. So a lot of those snakes are, well, they have more fear than you. So they're on their way. Yeah. So, but it is regular. People aim for snakes, of course, in this neck of the woods, but um, getting out and just stomping the ground, you don't have to pick them up. Mm, I don't. I'm scared of snakes. <laughs> I'll um, wrestle a rhinoceros, but I won't pick up a snake. <laughs> Uh, do any animals in Australia have rabies or other diseases that can be dangerous to humans? It's it's, mm. it's bats, right? Is it bats? People yeah. shouldn't handle bats. Yes, you need to. Um, yes, you need to be uh, have your needles against. I heard the uh, wildlife people have their uh, bloods taken uh, periodically and um, have booster shots of uh, vaccine. So that's a good one. Yeah, you don't really want to do. Uh, bats, microbats, or um, or the bigger um, flying foxes. Um, I don't know. I always think, you know, people say, I'm not picking up a lizard. It might have ticks, but the dog's got ticks. You probably got more of a chance of getting a diphtheria from going to the local toilet at the local plaza and touching the doorknob than you have with any native animal because they groom themselves in their own environment. They eat uh, natural foods. You know, most of them are herbivores anyway, so you could eat their poo. But, you know, so um, I don't fear them all that much. Yeah. But, I, yeah, I certainly haven't got a medical degree. But, um, yeah, you certainly need to be cautious as well with hygiene as with any animal. Um, Mari's asking, Greg, if you could explain a little bit more the, the figure eight to release from a fence. Oh, with the poor old kangas, they jump the fence. They usually hit the top strand, uh, but the, with some part of their leg, but the bottom part gets the second strand. So you have two strands, it twists, and all of a sudden you've got a figure eight in the wire. So it's a really tight twist. A little bit like putting a pen or, you know, a steel pipe between two bits of wire and turning it around once, you're going to get a figure eight. Um, the same as you would with a piece of string if you did that. So that's what contains kangaroos and wallabies um, in inside a fence. Not so much the barb that um, affects those. It, the barb affects birds and microbats and, you know, everything else. But, uh, yeah, the most... A uh, common situation with macropods is they just get caught between two strands and their body weight throws them over. Usually the head sort of hits the ground and uh, the rest of the body is in the top strands. Um, if there's one here, and this might be a good one for you. It's in the chat. Um, we've had more than 40 koalas killed and another 40 or so injured on the road near a reserve in inner Brisbane, but in almost all cases, the driver didn't stop. 
Yes, this is a, a question about engaging people to take that responsibility, but I guess it also relates to, well, if there's lots and lots of animals being killed in a certain spot, it, it might be something to engage the council on or somebody else. Do you want to? Do you want to respond to that one, Anne? Or? No, <laughs> that's a hard one. <laughs> it could, it's a good question. I mean, it's really mm. sad for for any animals, but to have body koalas like that, and it's something that definitely is. Um, as wildlife rescuers, often the people who call us aren't the ones who've, who've hit the animal. Um, and I think that's something that definitely should be raised, uh, you know, so that people understand to take responsibility and, and the right thing to do if you hit an animal. But I, I don't have a, a special answer to that. I don't know if you do, Greg, of anything. But, you know, I guess, like you say, when we talk about possibly later, if we have time, that um, trying to raise awareness in your community um, just about what to do if if you do hit an animal and that there's no blame and who you can call. Sometimes people just don't know what to do. Sometimes people are in shock. Um, yeah, there's all sorts of reasons. Some people don't care. But I think there are those other people who just don't know what to do. And so I guess by raising awareness about that and and knowing who to call and um, and there'd be no judgment and those sorts of things is important. And somebody else has has raised an issue that we have also thought about, which is about making um, this kind of information about what to do if you hit an animal part of um, driver education programs and part of like getting your license. And I think that is a something that could be really um, useful and helpful. And I, I mean, I think government's got a role to play and there has been campaigns um, with billboards and I, I know they did a social media campaign in New South Wales earlier in the year about what to do if you hit an animal. So I think it's something that we could all be lobbying um, government to take more of a responsibility for. And I know we've met with the NRMA about the NRMA doing more work on that. I mean, they have access to so many drivers and they're a very respected organization so we have trying to be work with them on you know putting more information in their magazines and through their social media um all right well we might move on zo do you want to talk a little bit about your amazing work and um yeah just what showing people what can be achieved when you don't look away i guess um do you want me to, sh do you want to just chat or do you want me to share the slides? Share uh, yeah, slides? share the slides if that yeah. works for you. Yeah, and then you can go. So I'm really lucky where I live in Penrith to have uh, a lot of open space out here and um, a lot of um, native animals in my area. Uh, there's a couple that I grew quite fond of in the um, local university grounds. Um, and I go and visit them all the time. So um, when I saw some uh, developments springing up on either side of where these kangaroos lived, um, I saw that their behaviour really changed. I don't know anything about kangaroos. Um, um, I, ju I just started to watch their behaviour once, you know, and I go and have my lunch with them and stuff, um, and I noticed that they were getting really spooked and then I saw on like our local Facebook groups that um, people were saying, oh, there's kangaroos, they're scared down in this road um, and they've been locked out of a fence and they can't get back in. What do we do? And there were a lot of people, a lot of locals that were fond of the kangaroos as well. Um, and they were worried and they didn't, nobody knew what to do. Um, so after about, uh, two weeks of people being worried and, and nobody actually doing anything. I just thought, really, like, where can I start? So I emailed the council and, you know, anybody that's ever had to try and work with councils, um, it was um, tricky and I didn't get heat really far. Um, so I um, put posts up on my local Facebook groups asking if anybody else knew where to go or if anybody else could help with anything. Um, and that's when I found um, the Animal Justice Party's local member for me, Vanessa. Um, she said, yeah, that she should be able to try and gain some support and maybe put together a petition because other local people were really upset about the kangaroos as well. Um, from there, it sort of just snowballed. 
mostly because I got really angry that um, I was being passed off by a council, by the university, um, by state roads, the, the state government, um, because I was asking for signs to be put up on, um, on our local roads. Um, council was saying it was state government's responsibility. Uh, state government was saying it was councils. People were saying, oh, it's a uh, national parks and wildlife issue. And um, really, I think just, um, just sheer spite kept me going um, and uh, and after eight months or so, we've got 2,500 um, uh, signatures on our petition to save Penrith's kangaroos. Um, I, I feel that when the council or Western Sydney University see my name on an email pop up in their inbox, uh, they'll be frustrated and annoyed and nothing brings me greater joy because while uh, they see me as a nuisance, um, I see my mates um, being killed every day on the roads. So, um, and I'm, I don't feel that any response that I've received so far has been adequate and uh, it just spurs me on to keep going. So I contacted my local newspaper as well because our community loves the kangaroos. So I thought that everybody had a right to know what was happening. The, the developers didn't want to... Uh, get back to me. Nobody had a plan. Everyone just said, oh, well, they're not an endangered species. So we can herd them off the um, the area and just build onto it. And I didn't think that was good enough. And neither did the Western Weekend, thankfully. So that made the front page of our local newspaper. Um, it was a shocking photo that they used of me, but hopefully it didn't take away any of the uh, the story. And there the, are my friends behind me in, in the sunlight there. So I've watched, you know, Joey's be born and, and raised and, um, and it, it spurs me on every day, motivates me to keep making a noise, keep being a, making a nuisance of myself. And in the, um, in the process of, of being a nuisance um yeah we i we went down to the local river handed out some cupcakes and got people to sign um the petition i've made some really good friends i've learned a bunch as well um i was a member of the animal justice party before all of this because i love animals um but i never really saw myself as doing any of this sort of stuff i never saw myself on in the paper or being the face of a campaign um and it, not that it sits well with me anyway but um i think that it really goes to show that um you know just normal people locals that live in the in the area and they see something that's wrong i think that there's no limit to what you can achieve when your passion is to help an animal, while they don't have a voice, um, I'm happy to stick my neck out and be their voice for them. I'm happy to uh, to be the bad guy here, to um, and to try and get something done for them. And I know I fall asleep every night thinking, you know what, this is never going to work. They're never going to listen to me. They're going to, you know, I, I can't even imagine what what's going to end up happening. But I don't think that I could sleep at night. If I didn't try and do something for them, I can't imagine. So, if something's wrong, if you see something's wrong, if if everybody in your community or if nobody in your community gives a, a crap about anything, get angry about it. Go write to people. Go show up at, at petition at, at petitions. Go, you know, hand out some flyers. Make a noise. You know, it might be in vain. And I, it will break my heart if it is in vain, but I know that I did the right thing by them. And I thank you all for um, for staying around and listening. Mm. Thanks, Zoe. And those, I mean, Greg, I think Greg said that he's never seen anybody get further with a, a project because what we want to happen is for those kangaroos to be relocated and whilst, you know, it would have been ideal for them to be actually considered in the yeah. development process, they weren't. And now there's more development planned and there'll be nowhere for these kangaroos to go. So Zoe's pr pretty close to getting those kangaroos relocated. And 
Um, I've been speaking to Emma Hurst about really addressing this with the planning ministers and because they're just fobbing it off and they just fob you off at every point and council says it's state government and state government says it's council and then somebody else says that developers and it's like a I don't know if it's a conspiracy it feels like a conspiracy or just feels like just deliberate attempt to make it incredibly difficult for the average citizen to um, deal with these bureaucracies but it's been amazing and i feel that it's a, an issue that resonates more and more with communities every day when they see native animals displaced, native animals that have lived there for so many years. And as you said, Zoe, that people love those animals yeah. and appreciate them. Yeah. Um, great. Well, there might be some questions, but um, and I'm going to um, throw over to you and all the work that you've been doing, which is amazing and um making a lot of progress as well for kangaroos in your area. We don't have much time. I can see we're running a bit late, so I won't get, go into too much detail. But I guess it's same, similar to Zoe where, you know, I live in my community and I've got a, a lovely mob of kangaroos that I've sort of taken ownership of and, and care about. Um, and that sort of, you know, pushes you, I guess, to try to find ways to, to help uh, the animals in your community. So for me, it was kangaroos uh, being hit by cars in a particular spot where I live. And I noticed over the years that I've been here that there were just lots and lots of kangaroos on the side of the road. And I always wondered what I would do about that. And I wasn't quite sure at the time until I became a wildlife carer and rescuer and, and then started looking into to different things we might be able to do. Um, and so one of the things I, I would like to do um, is to trial virtual fencing. Um, it's a big project that I'm hoping to get up and running in the next couple of years once I find some funding. Um, and two of the areas that I'm looking at are in the Hawkesbury and the Hills area because uh, that's sort of a big a big uh, hot spot for me um, in my community. So I guess it's just if you're living in a community where there is a big problem, just trying to find people you can partner with um, and look at strategies uh, to try to help with that. You can go to the next slide, Louise, that's fine. Um, so one of the things uh, I did was I contacted, I wrote, I think for five years I've been writing to my local council until they're probably a little bit sick of me too, like so. I think they've got a, a file on, on my name there <laughs> with all the emails. Um, but constantly um, just reporting and saying that this is not okay. And I think the more community members that do write um, and say that it's not okay, the more they're going to listen to you. And I think that's really important. Number one, obviously, if you notice there's a hot spot uh, in your community to, to contact uh, your local wildlife group, because we do keep statistics uh, on those sorts of areas and we do try to report and advocate um, as well. But also as a local community member, um, if you can have the numbers where you can write to council and say, look, they were 10 kangaroos hit and killed by cars just in the last two weeks. This is a big problem. Um, and if you've got photos and you've got exact locations, because often what they will try to do is just say, oh, look, it's unpredictable or we can't do anything about it. But for most people, we know there's a certain section of road that they do cross, whatever animal happens to be in your community. And there are patterns, definite patterns to uh, these motor visual vehicle collisions. So if you can keep statistics on numbers, take photos, whatever evidence you have, and be very specific when you contact uh, council to discuss it. One of the things I noticed was I would send photos of the kangaroos and the joeys and think that they would be appalled to see the things that I see. Um, but I started to notice that it wasn't until I, I talk about what it means for humans that they they pay a bit more attention so rather than saying that there were 10 kangaroos killed, I would say that there were 10 motor vehicle collisions in this area on this day. It's a hot spot. There's safety issues for motorists. What are you going to do about it? Um, and obviously, then I would talk about the impact on me as a wildlife carer being called out at three o'clock in the morning and the horrific injuries that I have to witness and the things that uh, I have to go through. So as a human, that's an impact on me. And an impact on the community members who call us, they're absolutely so distressed by the things that they see in their community that are happening to the kangaroos. So it's it's important to highlight that to the council to say, look, this is a community issue. These are people in the community, ratepayers, taxpayers who deserve to be heard. There is a big problem here. Um, what can we do to, to work on that? So one of the things we can do is uh, look at these temporary signs, uh, which they did put up in my local council until they can find sort of long-term solutions. 
Um, and the other thing you can do is to request uh, a speed limit reduction. So there is a website um, that you can go to in New South Wales, and it's probably similar in other states, where all community members can actually put in um, their particular road that they that they are looking at, um, and you can request, and we can send that link out to you. So you can say that, look, there were 10 collisions on this road at this time. We want the speed limit reduced from 80 kilometres down to 60 and they may not pay attention. I think I fill that form out probably every couple of weeks. Um, but if there's lots of people in the community filling out the same thing for the same area, then they'll have to start to take notice that, okay, look, this is an issue. So just one person, maybe not. But if you can get, you know, lots and lots of people saying the same thing, um, then hopefully they might pay attention because we know, as Greg said, that speed is, is a huge um, you know, impact on whether animals are, are killed on the roads or not. And and weren't you you were able also to get the council to pass a motion a, about virtual fencing and speed limits and yeah so it took quite a bit of time as I said I think I wrote for five years to anybody that would listen to me um, it's really difficult with local councils because it's getting the right person to listen to you so. I contacted the council itself, the infrastructure department are very black and white and say that there isn't any money available for wildlife strategies. So that's why it needs to be about motorist safety. Um, so you need to keep saying it's about roads and safer roads and the risk to motorists. Um, but it wasn't until the, the mayor at the time uh, actually responded and she met with me and spoke to me and, and we built sort of a bit of a a relationship, I guess, for her to understand what, what is really happening, that then she she actually put it forward as a motion. So I went to a council meeting um, and could present, you know, what was happening and, and get councillors to override the decision that the infrastructure department had basically said, no, that there's no money, no, we can't do anything. But because the councillors were supportive of um, the issue, then they could actually override that. But that that's quite a difficult thing. As I said, it's just getting one person to listen to you um, and having the votes from your councillors and, and I guess thinking about strategically how you can present the information um, to them at the meeting so that they might pay attention. Um, I did, did also invite people from the community, so I invited somebody else to, to come and speak as well, so it wasn't just myself, so we had a couple of different people there um, so that they were able to overturn, as I said, and, and put some things in motion. So. Um, it did take quite a quite a while, and uh, it's not a straightforward process. But I did have some some sort of movement with that. And Scott, well, oh, there's lots of lovely comments. Have you read the comments though? <laughs> um, and I think it's a nice photo too. It was a nice. <laughs> um, and I've got Julie. Um, was asking Julie's one a counselor up in for us in Bendigo asking about if there's um if we've written up the the project like the your Penrith project and I think and yours as well and I think we should take some time and I could work with you guys to kind of write up the steps like what do you do first what do you do second I think that would be just kind of a bit of a how-to guide because Amanda and we also have Amanda who is a brand new counselor in um wa and they've got the exact same problem with uh, kangaroos so i think uh yeah we'll spend some time putting a like a campaign how-to kit together because i think even though we're different governments in different states it's just it's going to be the same process but just different departments and there's a message here from Janice as well. Yeah. And Janice, you've been so amazing with all of the, the letters and emails you've been writing. And yeah, everybody's getting exact same rubbish from Prucar. Um, yeah. There's, is there any questions here I'm missing? I think there's another question here. Um, yes, um, yeah, it's nothing there. So, I think we have a really lovely video to sign off with that oh. Anne made about um, one of her beautiful rescue joeys. Um, and that will be a lovely way to finish the webinar. And thank you, everybody, for being so engaged and um, uh, all the comments and everything. So... Yeah, and obviously thanks so and Greg and Anne so much for being here and for all of the work you guys do. Do you want to hit play, Anne?
I cry whenever I watch that video. <laughs> it's very cute. Mm -hmm. um, all right. Well, thank you so much, everybody. And we'll send something out for you tomorrow. And I hope everybody has a lovely Christmas. And, yeah, I hope we don't see animals that need help. But if we do, I hope this webinar's helped everybody. And we'll send out more info tomorrow. Thanks, everybody. Bye. Thank you.